Good morning. I'm Rick Ellinger, one of the Sunday School teachers here at Calvary Baptist Church. We're going to be continuing in our Gospel Project Sunday School series this morning. We are going to be taking a look at Unit 20, Session 2, which is on page 70 in your um, student books. The title of today's lesson is Jesus is Tempted. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, precious Lord, our God, our Savior, Deliverer, thank you so much, Lord God, for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love. Thank you that we can call on you and, and turn to you and draw near to you, knowing that you'll draw near to us. And Lord, we thank you that we have an opportunity this morning to, to gather together, even across the internet, and even if not in person, but we can draw near to you wherever we are, and we can draw close to each other through this means. And we thank you, Lord, that we can study your word together this morning. We pray that you would help us to learn, to grow, to be challenged and changed by the power of your word. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we're going to be looking at Jesus is tempted. And as, as some of you know, we have recently looked at the baptism of Jesus. Well, Jesus publicly came into the scene through his baptism. He was set up to kick off his ministry with prestige and popularity. But where did the Holy Spirit send him next? To the wilderness, to be tempted. Kind of an unexpected turn, we might think. But it was through these temptations of Christ that we will see not only how Jesus is the true and better Adam, but we'll also get a powerful glimpse into the type of Messiah that he is, Savior that he is, and we'll learn how to stand firm in the face of the temptations that we ourselves will face day to day. Our first scripture passage that we're going to be looking at is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 4 to begin with. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. It's interesting and important point for us to note at the very beginning of this passage, at the very beginning of this experience that Jesus had, that it was the Holy Spirit who led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Often, when we're in seasons of great trial or temptations and going through hard times and tough things, maybe even like this current pandemic of, of the um, coronavirus, you know, we, we may be tempted to wonder where God is. Why has he left us alone? But that's not the case. God is always with us. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. And oftentimes even when we don't realize it, it may be God who led us into that particular season or trial um, for his purpose. We may have gotten it into, our, into it ourselves. Yes, oftentimes we do. But God is going to use it. But sometimes, just as in this case, it was God who actually led him to that place for that time for God's purpose, God's plan, which is always best. God is not absent in the midst of our temptations or our trials or our hard times. He's very present. He is not absent in the midst of our pain and our suffering. He's not absent in the midst of our wilderness experiences. He is just as present when we're in the wilderness as he is when we're up on those mountaintops and having great joyous um, times of celebration. He is with us in the low times. He's with us in the high times. Our emotions might 
tell us otherwise. We may not feel his presence. We may not feel like he is there, but he promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. Deuteronomy 31, 6, Hebrews 13, 5, to name two passages that, that he promises that. And God does not break his promises ever. God is working and active in the midst of whatever trial or temptation or persecution or whatever it is that we're facing. God is there and he's active, he's present, and he's working. You are not alone. I hope that you'll remember that. Let's look at this temptation. A couple, couple different breakdowns here. Um, in verse 3 is the actual temptation when Satan says, um, If you are the Son of God... Tell this stone to become bread. He knew Jesus was hungry. Jesus had fasted for 40 days. He hadn't eaten anything for 40 days. So Satan tempted him right where Jesus was. Okay. In 1 John 2.16, we get an explanation of the three basic types or areas of temptation. So let's take a look at that as we study these um, temptations today. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. That's sort of a breakdown of the three different types of temptations that we will face. And it is actually the three different types of temptations that Jesus faced here in this wilderness experience in, in Luke chapter 4, and also Matthew chapter 4 is another gospel that, that records it. It's also the three temptation types or areas that Adam and Eve faced in the garden when they fell into sin. But this first one um, is uh, the lust of the flesh. Um, <clears throat> notice that that Jesus resisted this temptation, first off. He didn't fall into it and sin as Adam and Eve did. He resisted it. But notice how he resisted it. That's an interesting thing that we really need to point out and take note of. He resisted it with the Word of God. Plain and simple. He didn't argue. He didn't justify. He didn't explain. He used God's Word. He quoted Scripture. I am always reminding my Sunday school class of the importance of memorizing Scripture. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible is Psalm 119.11 that says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's exactly what Jesus did here. He had God's word in his heart so that it would keep him from sinning against his Father, against God. If we don't know God's Word, we can't use God's Word. We need, to, we need to learn it. We need to study it. We need to memorize it. Then we can have it at a moment's notice when we need it, whatever situation we may find ourselves in, because we are going to be tempted. The devil's going to come against us. We need God's uh, sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to help us combat that. Notice this. Even though Jesus was hungry and vulnerable, he succeeded where Adam failed. Both Adam and Jesus were tempted with food. Adam with the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from Genesis chapter 3, and Jesus with bread after 40 days of fasting. They were tempted to satisfy their desires of their flesh. But instead of desiring it in, or to fulfill it in the proper God-given, God-desired way, the temptation was to fulfill it in a sinful, selfish way that was against God's plan and will. Adam and Eve listened to the devil and ate the fruit and failed. They gave in. They gave in to the temptation. They gave in to what looked pleasing to them rather than standing in faith and in firm obedience, trusting in what God told them was really good. Jesus, on the other hand, found his strength and sustenance in the Word of God. He quoted Scripture in his defense, and he obeyed 
God his Father. That is a great example for you and me, for sure. On page 71 of your student books, there is a fill-in-the-blank. Let me give you the answers to that and go over that. For those that don't have um, the book in front of you, that's okay. Um, the page says, Sinlessness of Jesus. While the Bible affirms the full humanity of Jesus, it also affirms that Jesus was completely sinless throughout his earthly life. Nevertheless, because Jesus was fully human, he experienced real temptation of sin, as seen during his trials in the wilderness. Now, in case you get confused and, and think temptation and sin are the same thing, hold that thought, because we're going to cover that here shortly in, in one of the upcoming points. Um, but they are definitely entirely two different things. So we'll get to that here shortly. But let's move on to uh, the second passage um, that we're going to be looking at today, which continues in Luke chapter 4, um, this time starting with verse 5, and it'll be the second temptation that, that Jesus faces um, here in the wilderness. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Sin has a way of tempting us with the promise of a better life now, taking sinful shortcuts to get a bigger stage, a better promotion, more power, more comfort, more money, more, 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 whatever. Sin tempts us to circumvent God's plan and timeline to get the result that we want without walking the path that God has for us. This type of temptation from 1 John 2.16 is the lust of the eyes. The get more, get what you want. If it looks good, take it. If what you see pleases the eye, then, then go after it. Go for it. No matter what. No matter what the cost and unfortunately, no matter what God's plan is, that's the lie of this temptation. To get what you want instead of what God wants, which in fact is always what temptation is leading us to. On page 72, you have a, another fill in the blank that is titled Temptation and Sin. I told you we would talk about the difference in the two and and here we go. Temptation is not the equivalent of sin. Temptation can refer to the natural and good desires that are twisted and directed toward pleasing of self rather than giving glory to God. Knowing our weakness, we are to be on guard against temptation that may lead us to sin, and we pray for God to deliver us from evil. Do you see the difference there? The temptation wants us, entices us, directs us to lead our lives away from God's plan and will. If we fall into that temptation, if we do what it is virtually telling us to do, then that's when it becomes sin and we have, have strayed from God's plan and will. Knowing that, we see Jesus here being tempted but we know that Jesus was without sin. Yes, he was tempted just like you and me. The Bible tells us that, and we see that here. But Jesus handled it properly. Jesus resisted that temptation and did not sin. When we fall into the temptation, that's when sin blossoms. It's like Barney Fife on Andy Griffith saying, Nip it, nip it in the bud. Well, that's exactly what Jesus is doing with God's word. He's nipping it in the bud. And that's what we need to do. We can learn a lot from Jesus' response to Satan's temptation. Because he did not try to reason with Satan. He didn't try to argue with him. He didn't try to explain why he trusted God's plan. He didn't get into an argument with him about it at all. He simply stated God's command and left it at that. He quoted scripture. This time he was quoting from Deuteronomy 6.13. When he said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 
once again, all he did was use God's word that was stored up within him to resist this temptation. Jesus chose to trust that God's plan was better than any shortcut Satan could offer. Jesus rejected immediate gratification, even for a good thing, something that was rightly his to begin with. Jesus knew that Satan's shortcuts always come up short and that God's word and God's plan will always prove faithful and best. If Jesus had taken the shortcut to have all authority, he would be skipping the suffering, skipping the crucifixion, skipping all those things that were undesirable and getting that immediate gratification. But at what cost? The cost of salvation for you and me. Because he wouldn't have fulfilled God's plan as that perfect sacrifice. Now let's go on to our last section here for today's lesson. We're going to continue with Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In this last and third type of temptation, as we look back again at 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, this type of temptation almost seems to be the trickiest, the most challenging, the most deceitful, because it has the appearance of trusting God. It would seem to say, oh, well, if you do this, you're putting your trust, your faith in God, your, your trust in Him to fulfill His, His promise to you to protect you. Notice Satan even used Scripture to justify that. He was quoting from Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12, when he said, it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up with their hands. He was absolutely right. To a point. <laughs> of course, everything Satan says is a lie. He twists and connives even the truth to, to use it for his devices. And that's what he was doing here. He was, he was quoting what God's word says for sure. But Jesus saw through the deception and realized that Satan was using it in a way that God had not intended it. We have to be careful of that, taking Scripture out of context and, and those kind of things. And Jesus um, fired right back with a, with a quote from Deuteronomy 6.16 when he said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Scripture warns us about putting God to a foolish test. Yes, God promises to be with us, to protect us, but that does not give us the right to act foolishly and recklessly just to achieve our own purpose and desires. It doesn't give us the right to not use the, the God-given wisdom that he has given to us so that we can act wisely and not foolishly. Temptation always wants to lead us away from God's perfect plan and purpose for our life. God's Word wants to lead us to and in God's perfect plan and will. God's Holy Spirit, living inside believers, wants to lead us in and to God's perfect plan. We need to learn God's Word. We need to quote God's Word. We need to study God's Word and know God's Word and claim and believe God's Word. We need to pray in the Holy Spirit at all times so that we can follow in God's way. He will lead us. He will guide us. He has promised to never leave us or forsake us. He's promised to be there. He has promised to lead us in the path that we should go. But we have to be wise and trusting and obedient and follow his way and not our own way. Don't listen to the temptations of the devil. Listen to God's word. 
And when those temptations do come, then use God's word, stand on God's word, and hide God's word in your heart so that you might not sin against him. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, wonderful, precious, loving God, thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on that cross to go through all of that suffering in our behalf and in our place so that we could, could know the hope and the blessing, the joy of eternal life with you in heaven. Lord, help us to resist temptation. Help us to stand firm on the truth of your word. Help us to be led by your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to honor you and glorify you in all that we do and every decision that we make, every word that we speak, that it be pleasing in your sight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.